Hi guys, welcome back to Rumor TV. I'm executive editor Andrea Subasati, and issue 189 is on shelves now, the July-August 2019 issue. It's our first ever queer issue, and on the cover, we've got an interview with Mark Patton, star of Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. He's got a new documentary out about his experience with that film. It's an awesome interview. You've got to check it out. We've also got pieces on the history of queer horror, some information on the upcoming Sleepaway Camp documentary, so be sure to pick that up and don't forget to like and subscribe this episode and we'll see you next time. Bye. Hello, you're watching Rumorg TV and my name is Allison Lang. I'm a contributing writer to Rumorg and I'm also the author of the Rumorg supplement Women with Guts. Uh, and I'm here to talk about a slightly unknown subgenre of horror film. Uh, as some of you know, summer is rapidly approaching and a lot of horror fans like to spend their summer vacations in, you know, dark theaters or dank basements, uh, watching, you know, summer camp slasher movies or perhaps a more beachy type of horror movie like Jaws or Piranha. And then there are some of us who like to go home to our sweltering swampy apartments, crank our barely working air conditioners, crack a cold one, sit in a pile of our own sweat, and watch a bunch of human beings melt into steaming, barely sentient piles of mushy goo. Please join me for this brief guide to melt movies on Rumor TV. For the purposes of this segment, I'll define a melt movie as a movie in which a human body is either disintegrated into goo or is consumed by goo. For many of us, our first exposure to a melt movie was maybe The Wicked Witch of the West and The Wizard of Oz. I'm melting! Melting! Oh, what a world! What a world! Or perhaps the wonderful scene in which the Nazis are dissolved by that dust from the Ark of the Covenant in Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> Or the scene from Robocop where the hoodlum driving the truck full of toxic ooze gets doused with the toxic ooze and eventually explodes. Slime has a nostalgic warmth for a lot of us, whether you were an owner of the GAC substance as a child or you had that weird creepy crawler oven where you could put slime and make little bugs out of it. Um, I think slime really has a soothing appeal for a lot of horror fans that's very, very deeply rooted for a lot of us. Um, so when we see these movies, it seems like they have a twofold purpose of both sort of soothing that weird little childhood itch that we have of seeing a bunch of gooey things and people falling apart into gooey things and big gooey monsters. Um, and a lot of the movies I talk about today also serve a sort of very slim metaphoric purpose uh, where the melting sort of is a stand-in for the evils of capitalism or environmental degradation. Um, and then it, some of them are just about that good old-fashioned experience of seeing a human body reduced to its most basic and disgusting elements. <laughs> the first movie I'm going to talk about is The Incredible Melting Man from 1977. Uh, this is kind of considered one of the pioneering melt movies uh, as far as that subgenre goes. <laughs> so like a lot of these movies, the plot is extremely simple. Uh, Colonel Steve West is part of a group of a astronauts flying to Saturn. Uh, they get doused by a wave of ra radioactive uh, energy, as so often happens with astronauts in these types of movies. And when Colonel West wakes up in the hospital, he realizes he's melting, he's melting! And also, he is murderous. So he escapes the hospital after tormenting a poor nurse, uh, and goes on basically a lumbering rampage to the California wilderness, uh, terrifying children and chomping on teens and old people. Uh, and the rest of the movie sort of deals with his pursuit by his good pal, uh, Dr. Ted Nelson. This movie is really only notable because of its amazing melting effects by none other than Rick Baker, who would go on to a little film called Star Wars. Baker was assisted on the shoot by Rob Bottin, who would use Baker's influence in this film to shape his own melting man scene in Robocop. I have to say, this is not a great movie. Um, the acting is fairly wooden and the dialogue is Tommy Wiseau levels of incoherent. Baker has said publicly that he's actually kind of embarrassed about this film, while the director, William Sack, says that, or claims, I should add, that he intended to make this as a satire on 
you know, 50 sci-fi B-movies and the producers interfered and made it into a more straight ahead horror movie, thus disrupting his original intent. I do have to say, I love the long scenes of the melting man stumbling through the wilderness, leaving smears of his essence on trees and bushes. It's really the stuff poetry is made of. Next, I'd like to chat about everyone's favorite goopy destroyer of worlds, The Blob. This is a rare case where the 1958 version of the film and the 88 remake, I think, are equally great examples of a wonderful, wonderful melt movie and a deeply entertaining experience. The first Blob features Steve McQueen in a very early role, doing his best James Dean impression as one of the tough guys trying to convince his town that this alien force is taking it over. I really love the late stage reveal of the blob in this film. It's kind of a good thing because when it does appear, as many of you are familiar, it kind of just looks like a giant jello mold. In actuality, it was a mix of silicon and vegetable dye and occasionally an actual balloon covered with goo. My favorite part of the original blob is the title sequence, which is very groovy and to be honest, far too classy for this film. <laughs> I love the 1988 remake of The Blob so much. This version of The Blob also leaps and creeps, but it craves human skin and flesh and blood. Much like John Carpenter's remake of The Thing, Chuck Russell's version of The Blob really honors the original film and keeps kind of that pulpy midnight movie feel while amping the gore and gnarly set pieces up to 11. Russell co-wrote the script with Frank Darabont after the two worked on Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3, and I really feel they brought that film's sense of very mordantly dark humor and also very ambitious death sequences. Here, the Steve McQueen role is played by a very young, pre-entourage Kevin Dillon, sporting a heroic mullet. Either way, I want you out of my face. You hard ass. Well, I'm in your face to stay. What are you going to do about it? Go ahead, hit me. He's supposed to be playing a tough hoodlum, but with that white collared shirt under his leather jacket, he really more resembles a dinner theater host from Poughkeepsie. All that aside, he and Shawnee Smith do a great job of again playing the hapless teens, convincing the town of this so-called alien menace, which actually turns out in this film to be man-made. Also, Shawnee Smith kicks serious ass in this movie and is almost a final girl prototype character. She brandishes a fire extinguisher. She has a shotgun. She jumps in a sewer and swims after the blob. She saves her little brother and runs back into a theater being consumed by the blob. She's actually the one responsible for destroying the blob at the end of the film by shooting a nitroglycerin truck and destroying it into a bunch of frozen smithereens. And let's talk about the blob itself here for a second. Aside from a few ill-advised green screen moments, this blob is a truly terrifying entity. It sucks men down diner sinks. It completely dissolves people limb from limb. Uh, and it also at one point grows a giant mouth. Like that's the most terrifying thing <laughs> imaginable. Truly the special effects team led by Tony Gardner, who is another Rick Baker acolyte, uh, deserve kudos here for creating a blob with more charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent than 90% of the human actors in the films we're going to talk about today. What is this? That thing on his hand. The next movie I'm going to talk about is not only deeply beloved in melt circles, but it's also quite beloved in genre film circles, I think, everywhere. And that is The Stuff from 1985. The Stuff opens with a couple of miners stumbling upon a gooey substance pouring from what looks to be the snowy ground. They dip their fingers in and have a taste because that's normal. And guess what? It's delicious. Soon we learn that the white substance has been mass marketed as sort of a ice cream yogurt substance known as The Stuff. Uh, replete with many fancy marketing campaigns, including a deeply annoying theme song and a lot of shiny commercials. However, something stinks with the stuff. Why do they never release their list of ingredients? Uh, a bunch of executives from Big Ice Cream, the struggling ice cream industry in this film, hire a former FBI agent turned industrial saboteur named David Moe Rutherford to investigate. Naturally, the stuff turns out to be a lot more than anyone bargained for. 
Namely, it starts to turn people into addicted zombies. And in fact, if you eat enough of the stuff, it basically takes over your entire body and eventually shoots out of you in a giant white wave, leaving an actual husk of a human being. It's up to Rutherford, snack food guru Chocolate Chip Charlie, played by Saturday Night Live's Garrett Morris. You're Chocolate Chip Charlie. Well, I sure as hell ain't the Kentucky Colonel. Get off Whoa. of me. And a deeply scarred Vietnam vet, played by Paul Sorvino. Sons of bitches. To figure out what's going on with the stuff and save the world who just can't get enough of it. The stuff is as hilarious and trashy as a Larry Cohen movie can be, with an anti-capitalist and anti-junk food message that is about as subtle as a jackhammer. That being said, there's so much to love about this movie, including a scene in which a suspicious young boy goes into a wild and ex inexplicably violent rampage at a supermarket, knocking piles of stuff off the shelves. Meanwhile, Rutherford is played by Michael Moriarty, a Cohen regular, in an absolutely legendary performance that I'm told was mostly improvised, in which he recites every line in a thick southern drawl and comically underplays every scene that happens in the film. David Rutherford? Mo, my friends call me Mo. Uh, they call me Mo because every time they give me something, I always want Mo. <laughs> to make the stuff, Larry Cohen employed a variety of substances, including shaving cream and, in one instance, a super disgusting concoction made out of fish guts. The poor actors. The stuff is pretty amazing. It sprays and goops out of eyeballs and orifices with abandon, and even comes out in mass quantities out of a mattress in a scene that uses that time-honored genre tradition of a rotating room. I really love the film's most pivotal reveal, that the stuff, unlike the more safe fast food properties of Coke and McDonald's, has no human-made additives at all. It's organic! The stuff, the taste that makes you hungry for more. The stuff, the taste that delivers. Now let's talk about the 1993 Australian film Body Melt, which in my view is the Citizen Kane of Melt movies. The plot concerns a bunch of very normie denizens of a Melbourne suburb. Uh, unknowns to them, they're receiving free samples of what they think is a health supplement in pill and powder form. The supplement is manufactured by a bougie and rather sinister health clinic run by an intensely sensual and evil female CEO. Residents of the suburb think they're popping these pills and it will make them healthier and thinner and faster and stronger, when in fact all they do is cause horrific genetic mutations. We're talking nostril tentacles, skulls caving in, bones melting, eyeballs popping, sentient placentas, raging hormones, and even an exploding penis. And quite honestly, that's about it. There is kind of a minor subplot about a group of cannibalistic hicks um, that probably wouldn't play too well in 2019, but really do any of these movies. This film is intended as a scathing critique of the health and wellness industry, but I actually think it's a more incisive criticism of the nuclear family as it exists in a suburb, and showing how easily these families can quite literally dissolve. <laughs> <laughs> the next movie I want to talk about is infamous in melt movie circles worldwide, and that is 1987's Street Trash. The sordid tale begins when a Brooklyn liquor store owner finds a bunch of mysterious bottles in his basement labeled Venom. He decides, as a thriving capitalist, that he's going to sell it to the surrounding homeless community for $1 a bottle. Little does he know it contains a toxic substance that turns these people's bodies into goop, and usually it's a pretty awesome looking, neon colored, very 80s type of goop. Meanwhile, the local junkyard is being run by a traumatized Vietnam vet named Bronson, and there's a local hapless cop, aren't they all, who's trying to run down the person who's po poisoning and murdering the homeless community. Directed by Jim Murrow, who would go on to great fame and fortune in Hollywood as James Cameron's Steadicam operator, the, the melting scenes and special effects in street trash are about as impressive and disgusting as you might expect. For me, the film's most iconic image comes early on when a poor guy chugs down a bottle of venom and literally melts in a symphony of gore and color into an actual toilet, eventually trying to flush himself down it. And Bronson's spectacular decapitation at the end of the film is satisfying in a way that few other things are. It bears mentioning that this movie probably needs a giant content warning, as it was designed to offend, I think, basically anyone who will ever watch it, ever. 
Uh, it punches down at a number of different marginalized communities, including the homeless, people with addictions, Vietnamese people, disabled people, uh, people of color, and especially women. Um, now, I know a movie that has a character named Drunken Wench is not exactly a feminist treatise, nor should it necessarily be. However, for me, the, the buck really stopped when a character's rape and murder by a bunch of homeless men was kind of played for weird laughs. Uh, I struggled with that a bit. So just be warned, um, Street Trash is really a classic of its particular genre, whatever it is. Uh, but you may want to keep one finger sort of poised over the fast forward button. <laughs> I'm Alison Lang. Thank you for joining me in watching this segment of Rumor TV on a very brief history of Melt Movies. And you know, we live in an uncertain and dark world. And sometimes you just have to lean back, take a minute, and let the goo happen to you. Oh my god. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh my <laughs> Oh my god, this feels so bad. <laughs>